What effect does solar activity have on life here on Earth? Why the time the solar wind reaches the distance of Earth's orbit? Its density is only a handful of particles per cubic inch. Even so, it is enough to have caused substantial radiation damage to life on Earth over the several billion years of Earth's history, if not for Earth's protective magnetosphere. When solar activity is particularly strong, such as during a solar flare, the stream of charged particles can increase dramatically. In that case, these ions can strike molecules in the upper atmosphere, causing them to glow. Those eerie, shimmering lights are called the aurora borealis. Northern lights, and aurora australis, southern lights. During this time, Earth's magnetic field can temporarily weaken, causing our atmosphere to expand. This can affect the motion of satellites in high Earth orbit. In extremely strong periods of solar flux, electrical power grids can be affected. Is it possible to fry an egg on the sidewalk? Well, not really. Concrete sidewalks are not actually the best place to cook an egg. Not to mention they aren't very sanitary. On very hot days, the sidewalk temperature can get to about 145 degrees Fahrenheit. 62.8 degrees Celsius, but an egg requires about 158 degrees Fahrenheit 70 degrees Celsius to cook thoroughly. On the other hand, if you put an egg on blacktop, you are more likely to be successful because the black surface will absorb more heat. Even better is using a metal surface. And people have been known to cook an egg on the hood of a car on a summer's day. What remarkable observation did science fiction author Arthur C. Clark make? Arthur C. Clarke, 1917 to 2008, is well known to science fiction fans. His 1948 short story The Sentinel was the basis for the 1968 film 2001: A Space Odyssey. Among his many accomplishments, he was also very interested in satellites. During World War II, Clark was a radar technician for the Royal Air Force. And in 1945 he proposed designs for a communications system using satellites. He reasoned that this was possible if satellites could be placed in orbit. Above the equator while traveling 22,248 miles, 35,797 kilometers per hour. This would put them in geostationary orbit. Meaning that each satellite would remain directly above a predetermined point on the Earth's surface. This idea proved correct, and is used now for both communications and weather satellites. The Clark Belt a band of space over the equator at an altitude of 22,300 miles. 
35,800 km, where geostationary satellites may orbit, is named in his honor. Where is the horizon? Depending on your elevation above sea level and assuming no objects such as mountains are obscuring your view and the sky is perfectly clear the horizon appears at different distances. To calculate how far the visible horizon is. First measure the distance between the ground and your eye level. Add to this the measurement of how high your elevation is. If your total is in feet, multiply by 1.5 and then take the square root of the result. Which will be in miles, if you used meters as your measuring unit. Multiply by 13 and then take the square root, the result will be in kilometers. Does lightning ever strike twice in the same place? Lightning can and often does strike in the same place twice. Since lightning bolts head for the highest and most conductive point. That point often receives multiple strikes of lightning in the course of a Storm so stay away from something that has already been struck by lightning. Tall buildings, such as the Empire State Building, often receive numerous lightning strikes during a storm. How fast do the strongest hurricane winds blow? The strongest hurricanes have winds that reach speeds over 200 miles, 322 kilometers, per hour. Friction with the Earth's surface prevents winds from blowing faster than 225 miles. 362 kilometers, per hour. What is oceanography? Oceanography is the study of the world's oceans. Including the waters and everything in them, animals, plants, and minerals. Oceanographers study the physics, chemistry, biology, and geology of the seas. Oceanography is important to understand in relation to meteorology for many reasons. For example, the oceans have a lot to do with heat absorption, distribution, and reflection. As well as with the water cycle and with levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, among other influences. Are all asteroids located in the asteroid belt? No. There are many asteroids in other regions of the solar system. Chiron, for example, which was discovered in 1977, orbits between Saturn and Uranus. Another example is the Trojan asteroids that follow the orbit of Jupiter near Lagrange points one group preceding the planet. 
the other following it and can thus orbit safely without crashing into Jupiter itself. Why does the Earth's orbit change from circular to elliptical over time? Like all the planets in our solar system, our world is subjected to the gravitational tugs of not only the Sun, but all the other planets as well. We know that our moon causes tides and other gravitational effects that we can see every day. But Earth's orbit is also influenced by the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. These planets are big enough to pull Earth's orbit out of shape as they circle the Sun. Then the Sun's gravity eventually pulls it back again in an extremely slow tug of war. Is it true that no two snowflakes are exactly the same shape? Some snowflakes may have strikingly similar shapes, but these twins are probably not molecularly identical. In 1986, cloud physicist Nancy Knight believed she found a uniquely cloned pair of crystals on an oil-coated slide that had been hanging from an airplane. This pair may have been the result of breaking off from a star crystal or were attached side by side, thereby experiencing the same weather conditions simultaneously. Unfortunately the smaller aspects of each of the snow crystals could not be studied because the photograph was unable to capture possible molecular differences. So, even if the human eye may see twin flakes, on a minuscule level these flakes are different. What is the National Weather Service, NWS? Part of NOAA, the NWS was founded in 1870 as the National Weather Bureau, it was renamed the U.S. Weather Bureau in 1891, and became the National Weather Service in 1967. It focuses on providing the citizens of the United States with warnings about possibly dangerous storms and other weather events. The NWS has forecasting centers in 122 locations around the country, including U.S. territories like Guam, American Samoa, and Puerto Rico. What methods do farmers use to protect crops from frost and sudden freezes? Frosts and freezes can prove to be a major hazard to crops. Especially in warmer climes where such incidents are rare. Some crops, such as citrus fruits, are particularly vulnerable, and there have been many years where orange, lemon, avocado, and other such produce have been nearly wiped out in places such as Florida, California, and Texas because of a sudden frost. One method that has been used to protect crops is called a smudge pot. These are portable burners that create heavy clouds of smoke which help to hold in warmer temperatures closer to the ground. Environmentalists do not favor this method, however, because it creates a lot of pollution. 
Another preventative strategy is to use huge wind machines. These giant fans blow warmer air downward onto the ground. Circulating away the colder air that hangs low to the surface. Interestingly, farmers sometimes also coat their crops in ice to protect them from frost damage. Using sprinklers, they will spray the vegetation down, and, as long as the temperature does not drop below 25 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 4 degrees Celsius, the crops do better than if they are allowed to go unprotected from the frost. What is numerical weather prediction? Numerical weather prediction or numerical forecasting is the science that believes that weather forecasting is possible if one has a thorough knowledge of the laws of physics and also knows the current state of the weather. Proposed by a group of Norwegian scientists collectively known as the Bergen School. The idea was that air behaves much like a fluid and that it therefore adheres to the hydrodynamical equations that liquids like water do. Knowing the current state of the weather is vital, and so numerical forecasting relies heavily on having detailed weather reports from multiple locations before predictions can be made. Once this is available, mathematical formulas are applied to the weather's current state. Based on the principles of thermodynamics, the Boyle's law, Newtonian physics, and so on. What caused a temporary but dramatic change in climate in 1816 called the year without a summer? On April 10, 1815, Mount Tambora erupted on the Indonesian island of Sumbawa. After what some scientists believe was a period of inactivity of about 5,000 years. The massive blast shot an estimated 24 cubic miles, 100 cubic kilometers, of rock and 220 million tons. 199.54 billion kilograms of sulfur dioxide almost 29 miles 40 kilometers into the atmosphere everything within 400 miles 645 kilometers of the blast was plunged into near total darkness tsunamis reaching 16 feet 5 meters in height crashed onto surrounding shorelines after the initial eruption, the volcano continued to erupt through mid-July. To make matters worse, two previous volcanic eruptions also contributed to dust and debris being thrown into the Earth's atmosphere. The volcano Soufriere St. Vincent erupted in the Caribbean in 1812. And two years later Mayon volcano exploded in the Philippines. In addition to all this volcanic activity, there was an increase in sunspot activity. Including one particularly large sunspot that was so big it could be seen with the naked eye. All of these events conspired to lower temperatures dramatically all over the planet. Canada, Europe and the United States were all very hard hit, particularly in the East and Midwest where crop failures were extensive in 1816. During that summer, snow fell a few times in New England in June. 
Vermont saw ice on its lakes in June thick enough to skate on. While snow was as deep as 18 to 20 inches, 45 to 50 centimeters, deep. After this bizarrely cold summer, the winter of 1816 to 1817 was rather mild. But that did not matter since the crops were all ruined. What is the difference between perihelion and aphelion? Perihelion is the point where the Earth is closest to the Sun. 91.4 million miles, or 147 million kilometers. This occurs around January 3rd every year. Aphelion is when our planet reaches its farthest point from the Sun, 94.5 million miles, or 152 million kilometers. Around July 4th. This variation does not have much effect on weather patterns or seasons. What unusual floating objects have been used to help chart currents in the oceans? In a rather humorous example of kismet, oceanographers have been taking advantage of a 1990 accident in which a Korean cargo ship accidentally dumped 80,000 Nike shoes into the ocean. Since then, whenever these shoes have been found floating in the Pacific Ocean and elsewhere, oceanographers have taken note. Tracking where the accident originally occurred and comparing it with the location where the shoes were found. In this way, they were able to gather additional information about currents. It wasn't long before another accident created a new opportunity for studying the currents. In January 1992 a ship hauling toys lost part of its cargo in a storm. Nearly 30,000 rubber ducks, frogs, turtles, and beavers fell into the ocean. As with the athletic shoes, these toys, as they washed up on various shorelines, served as excellent indicators of the course taken by ocean currents. What do the colors shown on television radars indicate? Colors on weather maps shown on television news programs are indications of precipitation levels. Cooler colors, blue, green, etc., indicate light precipitation. While warmer colors, yellow, orange, red, are used for heavier precipitation. What does it mean when we say something is on the lee side of the wind? If a person is standing on the lee side of something, say, a building or rocky prominence, then he or she is protected from the wind because that obstacle is between him or her and the oncoming wind. To what professional societies and organizations should a meteorologist belong?
most meteorologists in the United States participate as active members of the American Meteorological Society. Those specifically interested in the atmospheric sciences often also join the American Geophysical Union, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C. Meteorologists specializing in forecasting can join the National Weather Association for its benefits. The NWA is also concerned with the operational aspects of meteorology. How did people discover that Earth has a magnetic field? The ancient Chinese were the first to use magnets as compasses for navigation. Though they did not know it, these south-pointing needles worked. Because the magnets aligned themselves with Earth's magnetic field. Since Earth's magnetic poles have been very close to the rotational north and south poles, compasses point almost exactly north and south in most parts of the world. Over time, scientists started making a connection between lodestones, permanent magnets, and the nature of Earth itself. The English astronomer Edmund Halley, 1656 to 1742, for example. Spent two years crossing the Atlantic on a Royal Navy ship, studying Earth's magnetic field. Later, the German mathematician and scientist Carl Friedrich Gauss, 1777 to 1855, made important discoveries about how magnets and magnetic fields work in general. He also created the first specialized observatory for the study of Earth's magnetic field. With his colleague Wilhelm Weber, 1804-1891, who was also famous for his work with electricity. Gauss calculated the location of Earth's magnetic poles. Today, a unit of magnetic field strength is called a Gauss in his honor. What is the ozone layer? The ozone layer is part of the stratosphere, a layer of the Earth's atmosphere that lies about 10 to 30 miles. 16 to 48 kilometers, above the surface of the Earth. Ozone, O3 is like regular gaseous oxygen, O2, with an extra oxygen atom attached to it. It is created when short wavelength ultraviolet radiation interacts with O2 molecules. The energy from the radiation breaks the molecules apart, which then recombine into ozone. The ozone layer is important because it protects life on Earth from harmful ultraviolet radiation. While it does not absorb all of this radiation, otherwise, it would be impossible for you to get a 10. It prevents about 80% of it from reaching life on Earth. As anyone who knows about melanoma can tell you, too much ultraviolet radiation can lead to cancer. Before the ozone layer was discovered, someone must have discovered ozone. Who first discussed the link between climate change and how gases in the atmosphere absorb heat?
In 1884, American physicist and astronomer S. P. Langley, 1834-1906, was the first to publish a scientific paper on how gases in the atmosphere can absorb heat, which has an effect on the Earth's climate. Why do environmental firms hire meteorologists? Weather patterns have an important effect on the distribution of pollutants in the air, on land, and in our oceans. Environmental firms, as well as government agencies such as the Environmental Protection Agency. Hire meteorologists to help them predict the environmental impact of construction projects such as power plants and factories. An understanding of prevailing winds near a proposed coal burning plant, for instance will help people understand how potential air pollution, acid rain, and ozone levels will impact the environment not only locally but also, perhaps, across many states or even countries. How far away can thunder be heard? Thunder is the crash and rumble associated with lightning. It is caused by the explosive expansion and contraction of air heated by the stroke of lightning. This results in sound waves that can be heard easily 6 to 7 miles, 9.7 to 11.3 kilometers, away. Occasionally such rumbles can be heard as far away as 20 miles, 32.2 kilometers. The sound of great claps of thunder is produced when intense heat and the ionizing effect of repeated lightning occurs in a previously heated air path. This creates a shock wave that moves at the speed of sound. Who are storm chasers? Storm chasers are scientists and amateur storm enthusiasts who track and intercept severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Two reasons for storm chasing are, one, to gather data to use in researching severe storms and two. To provide a visual observation of severe storms indicated on radar stations. In addition, television personnel will chase storms to produce a dramatic storm video. Storm chasing can be an extremely dangerous activity in which strong winds Heavy rain, hail, and lightning threaten one's safety. Individuals who chase storms are trained in the behavior of severe storms. Roger Jensen 1933-2001, is generally considered the first person to be an active storm chaser. A self-trained weather observer and professional photographer. Jensen spent 50 years recording data on tornadoes as well as thunderstorms. David Hoadley, 1938 Is also considered a pioneer in the field and founder of the first newsletter on the subject, Storm Track. The first scientist who became a storm chaser was Neil Ward, 1914-1972.
who worked for the National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman, Oklahoma. And is considered the official father of the storm chase because of his credentials. What is atmospheric chemistry? As the name implies, this is the discipline dealing with how gases and other chemicals and particulates in the atmosphere interact with each other, such as with the formation and destruction of ozone. Both in the upper atmosphere and as a ground-dwelling pollutant. Atmospheric chemistry is a very complex science, as the composition of the atmosphere is in constant flux. Content is constantly being introduced from the ground, winds continually shift and flow. And radiation from space interacts with the atmosphere as well. Meteorologists specializing in this field have to understand geology, biology, and industrial pollutants, literally. Millions of different industrial chemicals entering the atmosphere daily, among other chemical processes. There is considerable work to be done in atmospheric chemistry. As much of what happens in the atmosphere at a chemical level is little understood. What are noctilucent clouds? Forming at altitudes of 47 to 56 miles, 75 to 90 kilometers. These are the highest clouds you will see in our atmosphere. Blown about by upper atmosphere winds averaging 100 miles, 161 kilometers, an hour. These cirrus-like clouds only form during the summer, and only at latitudes of 50 to 75 degrees north and 40 to 60 degrees south. They are usually seen at twilight and have a bluish or silvery color, sometimes flecked with red. It is speculated that noctilucent clouds may form as a result of meteor dust in the upper atmosphere because these clouds are more common when meteor activity increases. What is an ombrometer? An ombrometer, also called a microplaviometer, is just a technical word meaning a rain gauge. What is a meteor? A meteor is a particle from outer space that enters Earth's atmosphere, but does not land on Earth. Instead, the particle burns up in the atmosphere, leaving a short-lived, glowing trail that traces part of its path through the sky. Like meteorites, meteors can range from the size of a grain of sand on up, most of the time, though. A meteor larger than about the size of a baseball will reach Earth, in which case we call it a meteorite. What is a Maokaw breeze? A 
A maokaw breeze is the Hawaiian term for cooling winds that sweep down from the volcanic mountains to cool the warmer, lower regions of the islands. We haven't had a nuclear war, yet, so what sources are creating radiation pollution? Man-made radiation in the atmosphere comes from primarily two sources. Nuclear weapons testing and leakage from nuclear reactors, the latter mostly a result of nuclear plant accidents. After the United States invented the atomic and hydrogen bombs. There was extensive testing from 1945 through 1968. Over 300 warheads were detonated during that time. Mostly in desert regions and on small Pacific islands. The result was huge quantities of radioactive isotopes being spewed into the air. Including carbon-14, strontium-90, iodine-131, and cesium-137. While precautions were taken by the military so that no one was killed in the initial blasts. Radioactivity in the air traveled on wind currents and poisoned areas hundreds of miles from the tests. For instance, two days after a May 1953 test in Nevada, radioactive hail some stones the size of tennis balls fell in Washington. DC. Later, the United States tested nuclear weapons underground in an effort to curtail this air pollution, but, of course, the radioactive wastes of subterranean nuclear explosions can easily make their way into underground water supplies. Other nations, too, have conducted nuclear weapons tests over the years, contributing to the problem. Does thunder cause milk to go sour? No, this is an old wives tale. It may have stemmed from the fact that thunderstorms occur in times of heat and humidity. Which are conditions that, in themselves, can turn milk sour. Can weather cause bales of hay to catch fire? Dry bales of hay are perfect tinder to start a fire. The most likely scenario for a hay bale to catch fire is when it is struck by lightning during a thunderstorm. But green, freshly harvested hay can be incendiary, too. Methane gas can build up within the piles of hay as the foliage decomposes. And when the temperatures are hot enough the methane can combust. This happened, notably. In the summer of 1995, when hay bales ignited in several U.S. states, especially in Missouri. What is a snow roller? People aren't the only ones who enjoy building snowmen. Sometimes, nature gets into the game as well. In windy, wintry conditions, breezes have been known to start small collections of snowflakes rolling. 
as they roll, snow accumulates and the snowball gets bigger and bigger. Such snow rollers have been known to grow to diameters of several feet. How was Abu Ali al Hassan ibn al Haytham important to meteorology? Abu Ali al Hassan ibn 965 c. 1039, was a brilliant scientist in many areas, including engineering, physics, philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, anatomy, medicine, philosophy, psychology, and more. He has been called the father of modern optics and the founder of experimental physics attesting to his many accomplishments. His seven-volume book of optics, 1011 to 1021. Explained principles with applications ranging from ophthalmology to astronomy to meteorology. As it pertains to meteorology, his work is important for explaining such concepts as reflection. Refraction, transparency, translucence, radiancy, and optical illusions. Example Mirages. He made contributions to the study of rainbows and atmospheric density. What is pose? POSE is an acronym for Polar Operational Environmental Satellite. These are the successors to the Tyro satellites. And they are thus called the Advanced Television Infrared Observation Satellites, ATN or TyroZen. Like the GOES, there are two POSE operated by the U.S. Department of Defense's Air Force. Space and Missile System Center in what is called the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. The POSE orbit the Earth at elevations ranging from 515 to 540 miles, 830 to 870 kilometers. In altitude, with one crossing the equator at 7.30 a.m. and 1.40 p.m. Data is then Transmitted to stations located at Wallops Island, Virginia, and in Fairbanks, Alaska. What has the National Climatic Data Center reported about average temperatures in 2008? According to the NCDC, the average temperatures for the contiguous 48 U. S states was 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit 0.14 degrees Celsius cooler than the average measured from 1900 to 2000. When did the first weather map appear in a newspaper? The London Times was the first periodical to publish a weather map, which ran in the April 1, 1875, issue. The map was created by Sir Francis Galton, 1822 to 1911. An English scientist and half-cousin of Charles Darwin. Galton created his map which showed prevailing winds, barometric pressures and temperatures throughout the British Isles and parts of Western 
Europe without the advantage of satellites, computers, or even a telephone. What is fire weather forecasting? Fire weather forecasters concern themselves with studying rainfall, humidity, temperature, thunderstorms, wind and sunlight conditions that could leave areas such as forests and grasslands vulnerable to wildfires. These forecasts can prepare fire crews and other emergency support before a fire begins. And after fires begin they can help professionals determine such things as the possible direction. A fire will spread and whether or not an oncoming rainstorm might help put the fire out. Are there certain times of the day when tornadoes are more likely to happen? Tornadoes can occur at any hour of the day, but 40% of them strike between 2 o'clock and 6 o'clock p. M. The danger of a nighttime tornado is that people are often asleep and unprepared for when the warnings are sounded. Who helped link CFCs to the destruction of the ozone layer? Mexican atmospheric chemist Mario J. Molina, full name, Jose Mario Molina Pascal Enriquez 1943- and American atmospheric chemist Frank Sherwood Rowland, 1927. Are generally acknowledged as the scientists who first explained how chlorofluorocarbons were destroying the ozone layer. A paper they published together in 1974 first explained how the process works about four years. After scientists began to understand that ozone levels were declining in the upper atmosphere. The result of their work led the United States government to ban CFCs in aerosol cans in 1978. What is a heavy snow warning? A heavy snow warning is issued when the National Weather Service expects an accumulation of 4 inches, 10 centimeters, or more within a 12-hour period. Heavy snow warnings differ from blizzard warnings in that they do not depend on strong winds for an advisory to be issued. Can groundhogs accurately predict the weather? Over a 60-year period, groundhogs have accurately predicted the weather, i.e., when spring will start. Only 28% of the time on Groundhog Day, February 2nd. Groundhog Day was first celebrated in Germany, where farmers would watch for a badger to emerge from winter hibernation. If the day was sunny, the sleepy badger would be frightened by his shadow and duck back for another six weeks nap. If it was cloudy he would stay out, knowing that spring had arrived. German farmers who emigrated to Pennsylvania brought the celebration to America. 
Finding no badgers in Pennsylvania, they chose the groundhog as a substitute. Who hires meteorologists? Meteorologists can either work for the government or in the private sector. If they work for the government, they may be hired by a federal government agency or department. Such as the National Weather Service, the Federal Aviation Administration. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the Department of Energy, a national laboratory. Or the military, or, they could be hired by state, county, or city governments. Local governments hire meteorologists to monitor such things as air, pollution and other environmental and resource management concerns. In the private sector, meteorologists can find employment at television stations, including the popular The Weather Channel. Airlines, universities, utility companies, climate research laboratories. Meteorological equipment manufacturers, private research contractors and forecasting services, weather modification companies. Private environmental organizations and companies, and even litigation support companies. A good place to start a job search is the job board postings on the American Meteorological Society's website at http. Slash slash careercenter.amitsoc.org If at all possible. Start building career connections as early as you can preferably while you are still in school. Through work internships and contacts through your professors or other people you meet. How is wind speed measured? Wind speed is measured with a device called an anemometer, which was an invention of English physicist Robert Hooke, 1635 to 1703. The most commonly used type is the rotating cup anemometer, which uses three or four small cups that spin around a central pole. Modern anemometers of this sort work using electricity and magnets. As the cups spin, a reed switch within the central pole detects each time a magnet in a cup swings by. This sends out an electronic pulse that has been calibrated to calculate wind speed. The data is then transmitted to a weather station. What is a fulgurite? When lightning strikes sandy soil, the soil melts into a glassy stone called a fulgurite. These stones can appear branch or root like. Almost as if the bolt of lightning has been fossilized or petrified somehow. The glassy material in the fulgurite is known as lechatelierite. A substance that can also be formed by meteors striking the ground. One of the largest fulgurites ever found is housed at Yale University's Peabody Museum of Natural History and is about 13 feet, 4 meters, in length.
What is the ideal relative humidity that is the most comfortable for people? A humidity level between 30 and 60 percent is generally considered comfortable for human beings. While keeping humidity below 50 percent has the added benefit of keeping dust mites under control in homes. Lower humidities tend to lead to dry or cracked skin, itching, and even respiratory problems, and higher humidity causes perspiration to be less. Effective in controlling body temperature, which makes people feel hotter. In northern climates, where winter dries out the air, humidity can drop below 5%, which is comparable to the humidity levels of a desert. What is the solar spectrum? The solar spectrum is the spectrum of light that includes wavelengths both visible and invisible to the human eye. When diverted through a prism, this white light separates into the familiar rainbow spectrum of colors, ranging from violet to red. Temperature is affected by the longer wavelength spectrum, red through invisible infrared. About 50% of the sun's spectrum emerges as wavelengths at the infrared level. And 10% are in the ultraviolet range. Who invented the device to measure humidity? The hygrometer, which measures humidity in the atmosphere, was invented by the French physicist Guillaume Montons, 1663-1705. What is a person's circadian rhythm? Human beings have evolved in a world where there are regular cycles of day and night. And we have thus developed a kind of internal clock that makes us want to sleep at night and be awake during the day. This occurs even when we are, say, underground or in an enclosed factory. With no windows where there are no visual cues as to the time of day. The circadian rhythm controls such bodily functions as peristalsis, movement of food through the digestive tract, leading eventually to excretion, blood pressure, melatonin secretion, hormone levels, and alertness versus fatigue. In our modern world, people have tried to adjust to lifestyles that are not exactly commensurate with their circadian rhythms. Electricity and other sources of power allow us to work late at night. Drive vehicles, and operate machinery at times when our bodies would rather be asleep. The result is that more accidents involving cars and factory equipment happen at night than during the day. We are also much less efficient at night, even when doing safe activities like balancing the checkbook. How fast do hurricanes travel?
a typical hurricane will travel across the ocean at a speed of about 250 miles. 400 kilometers per day, or about 10 to 15 miles, 16 to 24 kilometers per hour. They have been known, though, to advance at speeds as fast as 60 miles. 96.5 kilometers per hour, which was the case during the New England hurricane of 1938. What is a banjo barometer? The banjo barometer is a barometer set into a banjo-shaped case. It was developed by Robert Hooke, 1635-1703, and was a very popular design because the Large dial was easy to read and was large enough so that you could get very detailed readings. Do other objects in the solar system have Van Allen belts? Yes. All the gas giant planets are thought to have such belts. And in Jupiter's magnetic field such belts have been observationally confirmed. Are there different categories of rainfall? Yes. Rainfall is categorized into three types. Convective rain happens when the sun warms the air near the ground, as the air then rises. It cools in the higher altitudes and water droplets form, creating a rain shower. Orographic rain is caused when air masses are elevated due to a geological feature such as a mountain. At the same time, landforms create a kind of squeegee effect on moisture as it runs into mountains. The result is the same as with convective rain, because as the air cools in the higher elevation, rain may result on the windward side of the hill or mountain. Cyclonic rain is the result of interacting air masses, which collide and force warm air masses upwards. This type of rain formation often results in strong thunderstorms or hurricanes. How is rainfall measured? Agencies like the National Weather Service use very accurate devices that measure rainfall to the nearest one hundredth of an inch. The devices, known as rain gauges or tipping bucket gauges, collect rainwater at a point unaffected by local buildings or trees that may interfere with the rain. Who first theorized that there was a link between volcanoes and climate? As well as being one of the founding fathers of the United States. An inventor, and a diplomat, Benjamin Franklin, 1706-1790. Is often credited as the first person to notice that volcanic activity might be affecting weather. Observing that, 
after the eruption of Iceland's Lochy volcano in 1783, there seemed to be a period of cooler weather lasting into 1784. Franklin believed that the more common incidence of fogs in Europe was a consequence of the eruption. What is a front? A front is any boundary existing between differing masses of air. That is, masses that have different overall temperatures and humidity. Fronts come in four types, warm, cold, stationary, and occluded. A warm front is a front that is advancing over a cooler mass of air. While a cold front is just the opposite. Stationary fronts, as one might guess, represent boundaries between warm and cold air that are in relative equilibrium, although they can still move back and forth by as much as several hundred miles and yet be considered stationary. An occluded front occurs whenever a cold front instead of merely overtaking warm air, actually separates and breaks apart warm mass of air. Occluded fronts come in both warm and cold varieties. In a warm occluded front, the cold air at the advancing side of the warm front is cooler than the air in the cold front that is overtaking it. In a cold occluded front, the cold air at the advancing side of the warm front is warmer than the air in the advancing cold front. Why do more people die in cold waves in the American South than they do in the North? Simply put, cold waves have proven more lethal in the South because people are not as well prepared for them. Homes and other buildings tend to have poorer insulation. And people do not own as many if any warm winter clothes. When are you most likely to see sprites and blue jets? The best chance to see one of these brief, strange lights is in the middle of the night. When you are near a strong thunderstorm and far away from the light pollution of a city or town. The storm should be more than 100 miles, 161 kilometers away, but no more than 300 miles, 482 kilometers distant. Estimate the height of the storm clouds. Then multiply that by 8 to get the approximate altitude where the sprites and blue jets may appear. Sprites may appear as reddish, orange, white, or even greenish flashes. Blue jets are even harder to see, but you are more likely to view them if the storm includes hail. How far can a dust storm travel? Central Asia and China have annual dust storms in their desert areas almost every April. And the dust from these storms has been known to reach as far away as Hawaii. On the other hand, 
Dust storms from Africa have blown dust all the way to Florida. Blowing dust can actually be a good thing, as it helps distribute soil nutrients around the planet. For example, it is known that rainforest soil in the Amazon is replenished from African soil. As is soil in the American Southeast. What is a solar prominence? Prominences are high-density streams of solar gas projecting outward from the sun's surface. Photosphere, into the inner part of the corona. They can be more than 100,000 miles long and can maintain their shapes for days weeks, or even months before breaking down. What is the Saffir-Simpson hurricane scale? The Saffir-Simpson hurricane damage potential scale, which is the full name is a five-point scale invented in 1971 by engineer Herbert Saffer, 1917-2007, and Robert Simpson, 1912, a hurricane expert. Rating hurricanes on a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 being the weakest and 5 the strongest. The scale ranks these storms according to peak wind speeds and the amount of damage they cause. How do you convert inches of mercury to millibars? When measuring air pressure, sometimes inches of mercury are used, and sometimes millibars. To convert inches of mercury to millibars, multiply the number of inches by 33.8637526 or 33.86 will give you an accurate enough measurement to do the calculation in reverse multiply millibars by 0.0295301 or 0.03 for an estimate to give you inches of mercury What is the storm of the century? Over the years, a number of storms have been called storms of the century. The 20th century experienced several storm events that could certainly qualify or at least be nominated for this honor. A huge blizzard struck the Midwest from January 10 to 11, 1975, that included Snowfalls in Nebraska reaching 19 inches, 48 centimeters, deep, wind chills of minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit Minus 62 degrees Celsius, in the Dakotas, and wind bursts of 90 miles, 145 kilometers, per hour in Iowa. 80 lives were lost as a result of this storm. Another candidate for the title arrived on stage in 1993, when a blizzard struck the American East Coast, killing 318 people, including 48 at sea. 50% of the American population was affected in some way by the storm. The storm reached from Maine to Florida, 
where half a foot of snow even fell in the Florida panhandle. And even Daytona Beach saw freezing temperatures. Winds near Key West raged at up to 109 miles, 175 kilometers, per hour. Meanwhile, Mount Laconte, Tennessee, saw 56 inches, 142 centimeters, of snow. And in Syracuse, New York, there was 43 inches, 109 centimeters, of the white stuff. The 1993 storm ranged far beyond U.S. borders, however. Extending north to Canada and south all the way to Central America. At its peak, it reached the strength of a Category 3 hurricane, and by the time it was over it had dumped 44 million acre-feet. About 14.3 trillion gallons, or 54.3 trillion liters, of water onto the ground. Add to this several killer tornadoes. And perhaps the 1993 storm wins the 20th century's title as storm of the century. What are sun dogs and moon dogs? When ice crystals are present in the air, the light from the sun or moon can be reflected, causing bright spots to appear on either side of these heavenly bodies. Sun dogs also called mock suns or parhelions are sometimes so bright that they look like two companion suns appearing at angles of about 22 degrees on either side of the sun. Because of their unusual what was the yellow bubble lightning seen in 1991? And Bristol, England, two girls playing frisbee in 1991 encountered a bizarre yellow bubble of energy. It came in contact with them. And both received what felt like an electric shock that threw them to the ground. They lost their breaths for a moment, and upon recovering, ran home and told authorities. No one ever figured out what they saw, but it might have been an unusual form of ball lightning. Behavior, in the past some people have associated them with spirits or other supernatural events. Ball lightning can wander in and out of rooms, usually vanishing harmlessly. But sometimes leaving holes in windows or doors. What is the Storm Prediction Center, SPC? A part of the National Weather Service and the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. The Storm Prediction Center focuses its efforts on forecasting only hazardous weather, including heavy rains and snows as well as conditions that could lead to dangerous wildfires. Besides rime frost, what other types of frost are there? Different weather conditions can cause frost to form in various ways. Sometimes with spectacularly beautiful results. The types of frost include, advection, wind, 
Frost is frost that forms on the edges of plants and other objects. Advection frost is formed on the upwind side of objects during very cold winds. Fern, window, frost gets its name from the fern-like patterns it forms on windows. Especially windows that are not well insulated. Flaws in the glass's surface provide the nucleus needed for water vapors to form crystals. Which then radiate outwards in intricate patterns. Frost flowers are the result of a rare interaction between plants and the weather. When water inside a plant stem cracks or splits due to the cold. The water can escape and then freeze into flower-like shapes. Because they are so fragile, frost flowers usually break apart or melt within hours of forming. Hoar, radiation, frost is formed on clear nights when surface objects are colder than the surrounding air. It appears as white, loosely organized crystals. Hoarfrost may appear similar to rime, but unlike rime it is formed without the presence of mist or fog. What is kyanophobia? Kyanophobia is a fear of snow. What is a crepuscular ray? A less technical name for a crepuscular ray would be a sunbeam. Such as can be seen when streams of sunlight emerge from behind a cloud during the twilight hours, crepuscule means twilight. In the Bible, they may have inspired the story of Jacob's Ladder. Genesis 28 11-19, and so they are often named after that story. Another descriptive phrase for crepuscular rays is the sun drawing water because people once believed that the beams of light were actually formed by water being sucked up into the sun. Because these rays are seen as clouds are breaking up. Folklore rightfully interprets them as a sign that good weather will likely be ahead. How does the motion of Earth around the Sun cause the seasons to occur? Some people mistakenly think that the seasons are caused by Earth. Being farther from the Sun in winter and closer to the Sun in summer. This is incorrect. Earth's elliptical orbit is close enough to a perfect circle that distance is not the reason. In fact, Earth is closest to the Sun in early January and farthest in early July. Which is exactly the opposite of our summer and winter seasons. The reason for the seasons has to do with the angle at which sunlight strikes any particular place on Earth at any given time of year. The angle changes throughout the year because the tilt of Earth's axis differs from the ecliptic. Since the Earth is tilted 23.5 degrees, the Sun's rays hit the northern and southern hemispheres unequally. When the Sun's rays hit one hemisphere directly, the other hemisphere receives diffused rays. The hemisphere that receives the direct rays of the sun experiences summer. 
the hemisphere that receives the diffused rays experiences winter. Thus, when it is summer in North America, it is winter in most of South America, and vice versa.